You've written about going to church as a boy. When did you become an atheist? I think I started getting doubts when I was about nine and realized that there are lots of different religions and they can't all be right, and it was an arbitrary accident which one I happened to be brought up in. I then sort of rather went back to religion at the age of about 12 and then finally left it at the age of about 15 or 16. Was it just that intellectually God and religion just didn't add up to you? I mean, is that why you turned against religion? Yes, purely intellectually. I was never much bothered about moral questions like how could there be a good God when there's so much evil in the world, which is what bothers most people. For me, it was always an intellectual thing. I wanted to know what the explanation was for the existence of all things, the existence of life in particular. And when I discovered the Darwinian explanation, which is so stunningly elegant and powerful, realized that you really don't need any kind of supernatural force to explain it. That was what finally did for my religious belief. And did you call yourself an atheist at that point? Yes. Why an atheist? Why, why not an agnostic, for instance? Well, technically, you cannot be any more than an agnostic, but I am and was as agnostic about God as I am about fairies and the flying spaghetti monster, etc. That You've heard the argument before, I'm sure. You cannot actually disprove the existence of God, and therefore to be a positive atheist is not technically possible. But you can be as atheist about God as you can be as atheist about Thor or Apollo. Everybody nowadays is an atheist about Thor and Apollo. Some of us just go one God further. So when you're talking about God, I mean, you are really, for the most part, you're talking about the God of the Bible, Yahweh of the Old Testament. Well, as it happens, I am, because I have an eye to the audience who's likely to be reading my book. Nobody believes in Thor and Apollo anymore, so I don't bother to address the book to them. So it is, as in practice, addressed to believers in, shall we call it, the Abrahamic God. Now, one thing that you say in your book that it, it struck me is that you, you say that atheists are widely reviled, especially in the United States, and that the status of atheists in America today is on a par with homosexuals 50 years ago. I guess the question is, doesn't it all depend on where you live? Because I know various cities and academic communities in, in the U.S. where I think it would be a lot harder to be an evangelical Christian than an atheist. Yes, I should have qualified that, and, and as you rightly said, in other parts of the world, such as Britain, it is highly respectable to be an atheist in Britain and most of Europe. In America too, of course I should have acknowledged, and I apologize to my American friends, large parts of America, indeed just about 50% of the United States of America is intelligent and atheistic. Although the figures won't necessarily show that. That's interesting that you use those two words together, intelligent and atheistic. Are, are you equating those, that the more intelligent you are, the more likely you are to be an atheist? There's a fair bit of evidence in favor of that equation, yes. Do you want to cite any of that evidence? I mean, that, that sounds like an elitist argument there. It's certainly elitist. What's wrong with being elitist if by elitist you are trying to encourage people to join the elite rather than being exclusive? I am very, very keen that people should raise their game rather than the other way around. As for citing the evidence, it is in my book. A number of studies have been done. A meta-analysis is a statistical analysis of all the studies that have been published. And the one meta-analysis of this that I know of was published in Mensa magazine. He looked at, I think it was, 42 studies of whether there was a relationship between educational level or IQ and religion. And in I believe it was 38 out of 42, that's all but four, there is a correlation between IQ stroke education and atheism. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to be an atheist, or the more intelligent you are, the more likely you are to be an atheist. So what is so bad about religion? Well, as a scientist, the first thing that's bad about it is that it encourages you to believe falsehoods, to be satisfied with inadequate explanations which really aren't explanations at all. And this is particularly bad because the real explanations, the scientific explanations, are so beautiful and so elegant. And plenty of people never get exposed to the beauties of the scientific explanation for the world and the universe and life, and that's very sad. But it's even sadder if they are actively discouraged from understanding by a systematic attempt in the opposite direction, which is what many religions actually are.
But that's only the first of my many reasons for being hostile to religion. I could go on. My sense for you is it's it's not just that you think religion is dishonest or that it's it's putting blinders over your sense of reason, but there's something evil about it as well. Well, yes, that was really the mildest of the complaints in a sense. I think that there is something very evil about faith where faith means believing in something in the absence of evidence and actually taking a pride in believing in something in the absence of evidence. And the reason that that's dangerous is that it means that if you really take it on board and believe it, which is what many people do, then it justifies essentially anything. If you are taught in your holy book or by your priest or by your faith tradition that blasphemers should die or apostates should die, anybody who once believed in the religion and no longer does needs to be killed, that clearly is evil and if you ask people to justify that they don't have to justify it because it's their faith they don't have to say well here's a very good reason for this all they need to say is that's what my faith says and we're all expected to back off and respect that because whether we are actually faithful ourselves or not we have been brought up to respect faith and to regard it as something that should not be challenged and that, I think, can have extremely evil consequences because the sort of consequences that it has, well, historically, the Crusades, the Inquisition, right up to the present time where you have suicide bombers, people flying planes into skyscrapers in New York, all in the name of religious faith. But don't you need to distinguish between the religious extremists, those people you've just cited, for instance, who are quoting scripture and, and killing people because this is the way they interpret the scripture? Don't you need to distinguish between those and moderate, peaceful religious believers? You certainly need to distinguish them. They are very different. However, I would say this. The moderate, sensible religious people that you've cited, in a sense, make the world safe for the extremists by bringing up children, sometimes even indoctrinating children, to believe that faith trumps everything by influencing society to respect faith. Now, the faith of these moderate people, of course, is in itself harmless. But the idea that faith needs to be respected come what may, that idea is instilled into children sitting in rows in their madrasas in the Muslim world, and they are told things not by extremists, they're told these things by decent, moderate teachers and mullahs. But when they grow up, a small minority of them remember what they were told. They remember reading in their holy book, whichever holy book it is, and they take it literally. They really do believe it. Now, the moderate ones don't really believe it, so they're all right. But they have taught the children that faith is a virtue, and it only takes a minority to believe that it is literally true what it says in the holy book, that the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, whatever it is, if you believe it's literally true, then there's scarcely any limit to the evil things that you might do. Now, you, you make a, a, a rather inflammatory <laughs> assessment of religious education. I mean, you, you seem to equate uh, teaching children about religion or, or teaching children to be faithful as, as a form of child abuse. Well, I use the phrase child abuse for something slightly different from that, which is labeling children with a label like Catholic child or Protestant child or Muslim child. And I think that is child abuse because the child who is labeled very often is so young they can't even talk. And yet they will still be described as a Christian child or a, or a Muslim child. They are clearly too young to know what their beliefs about the cosmos and about humanity and about morality actually are, when they grow up, they'll be in a position to give some kind of an informed opinion. But at the age of four, or whatever it is, they are not in a position to give an independent opinion. Just to take this one step further, are you saying that if parents belong to a particular church, for instance, that they should not teach their children about that religion? I would say that parents should teach their children anything that's known to be factually true, like that's a bluebird, that's a Stella's jay, um, that's a bald eagle, that, that would be fine. Or they might say various people believe different things, they could teach children that there are such things as religious belief. But to teach children that it is a fact that there is one God, rather than uh, there are people who believe that there's one God, there are people who believe that there's many gods, or it is a fact that God created the world in six days, that is child abuse.